Okay, well, welcome today's, to today's Power Talk, Renewable Projects, Large-Scale Wind and Solar in Our Communities. Uh, before we continue, Courtney, would you be so kind as to offer a land acknowledgement from SAS Power before we continue? Sure. Uh, so SAS Power's work reaches the ancestral lands of many nations. As a crown utility, we reaffirm our relationship with the peoples of these lands and our shared determination to preserve the lands for generations to come. At SAS Power, we're encouraged to reflect on what we're doing to support reconciliation. And so what came to mind for me was the Bekevar Wind and Power Line project. Uh, in 2019, SAS Power ran an open procurement and chose Bekevar Wind LP, a partnership between Integreen Investments and Oasis Nahiawini Energy Development Limited Partnership, who's an wholly owned Cowessis First Nation entity to develop the wind generation project. For all renewable generation facilities, SAS Power requires a 10% minimum Indigenous ownership in the project, with more points awarded in the proposal evaluation to higher levels of Indigenous ownership. And this back of our wind facility has a 17% Indigenous ownership. These are pictures from the sod turning event. And what really stood out to me um, in going to this event, event is the significance of these projects to the communities that are involved in them and the excitement and engagement um, from all of these groups. It was really nice to see how the work that we do at SAS Power in the office translates into the community in a meaningful way. Okay, great, thanks Courtney. Okay, we've got several panelists with us today. I'll just introduce them quickly now, um, and then you will get a chance. We'll introduce them a little bit more fully later. So as I introduce them, they'll come along and, uh, and wave hello. So first of all, we have Courtney Bulkwell, who you just met. Courtney is the manager of independent power producer development at SAS Power. You'll use the, you will hear the term IPP, so independent power producer is the long version. Next, we have Erwin Hewick, director for Saskatchewan and for distributed energy resources at the Canadian Renewable Energy Association, here to refer to as CANREA going forward. Um, next is Jennifer Chamberlain, Manager of Community Planning with the Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities, often referred to as SARM. And we get two Jennifers today. Jennifer Sargent is the Manager of Environmental Assessment and Approvals at SAS Power. So thank you to all of you for, uh, for joining us today. And again, we'll be connecting with them a little bit more uh, as we go through the session. Okay, just in terms of a, a quick overview, we'll start off with some public participation overview of the future supply plan. Then we'll be looking at independent power producers and why SAS Power uses them. Overview of the procurement process, talking about community engagement, um, addressing a few kind of common questions that come up uh, with this topic. And uh, with whatever time we have left, we'll, uh, we'll happy to answer as many questions uh, as we can. And we plan to wrap up uh, shortly before one o'clock today. In terms of uh, chat, um, again, use, use, the, uh, use the chat. If you have any questions, more kind of a kind of procedural process or support side of things, uh, someone will monitor that and uh, get back to you on some of those kind of things. Um, if you have a question, and again, as we get through um, and you do have questions, pop them into the Q&A uh, function inside of Zoom there. I'll be watching for those. Uh, we probably won't be responding back to them directly in, in, uh, in written form so much as I'll just be watching those and I'll bring that into our conversation with, uh, with our panelists. We will be recording uh, the meeting uh, session today and uh, in a few days hence, it will uh, appear up on YouTube with all of the other power talks that, uh, that have been taking place. And this is the fourth one in a series uh, and the last one in this, uh, in this particular series. So. So yeah, that's that's some of the housekeeping stuff. Um, a quick poll here, just kind of curious to know in terms of uh, have you have you joined a power talk before today? And I'll just put that up there. And again, these power talks have been going on I could, probably about a year and a half or so um, now. So we're curious to know how many uh, kind of return visitors that we have, or or how many are new. So I'll leave that open for a minute there. Looks like so far about 80% uh, have attended a power talk. So anyway, glad to have you back and uh, welcome to, uh, to those that are, that are attending for the first time. And if you're curious, there's some of our numbers in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of who's new and versus who's returning. Okay, 
Just a bit of a recap on some other activities, and I guess for those of you that have uh, joined, this will be a, a, a review for you. Um, but SAS Power is, of course, in the process of developing a long-term supply plan, that being a roadmap to ensure that SAS Power can deliver reliable, sustainable, and cost-effective power to 2050. And of course, a big part of that has been uh, this conversation with customers. And as I said, this has started back in the fall of 22, those stage one there, just understanding how people want to participate in a process like this. What do you want to know? And in fact, the Power Talk series was one of the things that followed that first stage, just understanding that people want to learn more and understand more about where their power comes from and just some of the things that happen behind the scenes. In stage two, focus more on what customer values and priorities were. In stage three, and again, I'm summarizing here, but all that feedback so far culminated in the development of four different scenarios that were used for discussion. What might this look like um, in terms of four different paths to a net zero future over different timelines? Most recently was stage four, and that was the first chance to take a look at the draft long-term supply plan. Um, the feedback process for that has closed, but certainly the, the plan is still available to uh, review. And if you want to go check that out, that's you can find that on the SAS Power engagement site at saspower.com slash engage. Um, in terms of some of the numbers, again, I think SAS Power has been very encouraged by the amount of people that have participated in this process, whether that's visiting the site, attending a power talk like this, learning uh, learning in um, and other other events coming out to uh, in-person workshops and and uh, and online workshops and as well as signing up for the newsletter. So yeah, to recap it so far, got over 60,000 online surveys that are completed, 679 in uh, workshops, almost 300 at in-person sessions, um, not including this most recent Power Talk series, about 1869 uh, at, um, at a Power Talk. Um, and of course, one of the topics that often comes up is this whole matter of um, particular power generation options. And on the renewable side, it often focuses on wind and solar. So happy to be looking at uh, this in more detail today. If you go through the uh, future supply plan, uh, the draft summary there, um, I'll call out just, I'm, again, I'm recapping at a very high level here, but just some of the um, some of the things that were framed up as lessons learned, and then there's a series of follow-ups to that, but I'll just recap them for you if, if, if this is your first time with it. The first is that customers are concerned with the price of power now and into the future. And this highlights the importance of competitiveness with neighboring provinces, but also this, this matter of affordability. Number two, many customers want to help Saskatchewan reach net zero GHG emissions. And many customers are really excited about the potential of, um, of wind and solar. The third, interconnections. Again, working with neighbors and, uh, and other uh, interconnections. Number four, our longstanding reliance on a diverse supply mix is necessary to continue to reduce risk. We need power supply alternatives to keep our option open. So looking at other options and, and more of some of the same. The fifth one, Saskatchewan residents want to know that we're looking at every supply option. Again, a lot of curiosity that I've seen and have you considered this and definitely that's a big part of the plan. The sixth one is the energy transition will lead to new challenges for our system that we need to accommodate to maintain reliability at the same time as we must maintain and update an aging power system. Uh, pardon me, an aging power system. So investments in distribution. And number seven, we must comply with the law and as regulations change, we must be quick to adapt. It's important that the federal government understands Saskatchewan's unique challenge to significantly reduce GHG emissions. So again, if you haven't had a chance to check out that plan, and again, I'm, I'm really summarizing some of the high level things here. Um, but yeah, these are some of the things that, uh, again, certainly some of these things relate to the conversation that we're having, uh, that we're having today. So I'll put this up. We had a, a poll before. I just want to put up this as in terms of a, um, uh, in terms of a, a, a trivia question. Um, SAS Power plans to how, add how many megawatts of solar and wind production to the power system by 2035? So your options are 1,500, 2,000 megawatts, 3,000 megawatts, or 4,500. We'll get the answer um, in a moment here, but uh, we'll, see, um, we'll see what the responses are so far to this. So let's give you one more moment to uh, participate there if you're going to. And again, if you're, depending on what you're connecting on, the, if you have the actual sort of Zoom client, uh, you can access it on the web, but uh, usually the actual Zoom app or client uh, works best. Okay, I'll close this off. In terms of results so far, uh, looks like most votes for 3000 megawatts. And, uh, and in fact, that is, the, uh, that is the correct choice. So yeah, so a lot of new capacity being added uh, and planned by SAS Power, so. Okay, let's get into, um, some of the other topics here. So um, 
with this, I want to invite Courtney back. I just want to give Courtney a sort of a proper introduction before, uh, before we start. So Courtney joined SAS Power in 2008 and has been the manager of independent power producer development since 2019. So in this role, Courtney works with IPPs to develop renewable power generation projects that support SAS Power's transition to net zero. A strategic focus of this work includes increasing the level of Indigenous participation in renewable generation projects. Courtney is also responsible for the management of contracts related to the marketing and sale of commercial byproducts from SAS Power's coal generating facilities. This includes CO2, fly ash, and sulfuric acid. Courtney holds a Bachelor of Science in Economics and Statistics from the University of Regina, as well as a Master's of Public Administration from the Johnson Shoyama School of Public Policy. So good to have you with us. Uh, I think you work on lots of different things here. So I guess maybe the first question is, why is SAS Power adding all of this new wind and solar? Sure, thanks, Derek. Uh, so wind and, wind and solar power provide a really cost-effective generation option for SAS Power. Uh, they help us lower our greenhouse gas emissions as we work towards a net zero future. Um, however, the, the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. So we must rely on other sources of generation. And there's really no one source that can meet all of our needs. And it'll take a combination of sources to provide reliable, sustainable, uh, cost-effective power into the future. Okay. So I guess a couple of questions. We talked about uh, IPP. So can you just tell us who IPPs are, um, why SAS Power partners with them, and then maybe what are some of the benefits that you see of having IPPs develop renewable generation for SAS Power? For sure. So um, IPPs are, as you mentioned earlier, Derek, they're independent power producers and independent power producers are private sector developers that SAS Power selects, typically through a competitive uh, solicitation to develop, own and operate generation facilities in the province for SAS Power. SAS Power use, uses uh, exclusively an IPP model for renewable generation facilities right now. And SAS Power partners with IPPs for a few different reasons. One of the main reasons is that there's a really mature market of renewable generation developers that focus on the business of renewable generation development. So by taking an IPP model approach to building renewable generation, SAS Power is really able to leverage this market of developers and tap into their development experience. And that, that really ensures that we get the best value projects for the province. Uh, we are also able to transfer a little bit of uh, some of the risks, project risks to the IPPs by doing this and not have to manage um, risks internally. Um, we also are able to select the most competitively priced projects as all developers compete in an open competition. And they all, so they all compete to um, secure a project and when they do that, we're able to select the lowest price project, which has the most minimal impact on our customers in the province. And that's a really important point as we move forward through the energy transition and add a significant amount of uh, generation to the grid. Uh, it all Taking an IPP model also allows us to engage with Indigenous communities in a really meaningful way uh, by setting uh, Indigenous ownership requirements, and um, Indigenous participation during construction requirements. We're also able to vet developers on a financial and an experience basis and really work with developers to ensure that meaningful partnerships are created between the developers, uh, the Indigenous communities, and the local communities that where the projects are being developed. Okay, thank you. Okay, I wanna invite Erwin. Um... And I'll give him a more uh, fulsome introduction now. Erwin comes from the industry perspective. So Erwin Hewick is Can Rea's Director for Saskatchewan and for Distributed Energy Resources. In his role, Erwin leads policy development and advocacy for wind, solar, and storage technologies in Saskatchewan and supports Can Rea's solar behind the meter and DER efforts across Canada. Erwin is a lifelong energy industry professional who served as the Director of Facility Planning with TransGas until 2018, then left to create and lead the Distributed Energy Association of Saskatchewan from 2019 to 2022. In his various roles, he has supported energy production, storage, transportation, and distribution discussions with academia, municipalities, governments, and utilities, now focusing on clean energy projects and development. Erwin holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the U of R, 
with an industrial systems engineering designation, and he is based uh, in Regina. So, Erwin, welcome. And uh, so, obviously, you advocate on behalf of the you know the renewable power and energy storage industries. Again, working towards benefiting uh, Canada's economy. I think in some of the sort of future technologies. What do you see from your perspective as the most compelling benefits of wind and solar when adding that to Saskatchewan's energy mix? Thanks, Derek. Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, as was mentioned, renewable energy is a cost-effective way to add new power to the grid. Uh, but importantly, uh, it's a long-term investment in rural Saskatchewan. Many of the developers that are developing out the larger wind and solar projects will also be the operators of these facilities. And they've got a vested interest in establishing and maintaining long, uh, good long-term relationships with the landowners, the residents, and the local communities. These facilities will be delivering significant local economic returns through municipal taxes, through landowner compensations, and in some cases, direct payments uh, towards the local communities. Uh, for a recent 200 megawatt wind project, these compensations have been in the order of a million dollars per year. Okay. So in your experience, what trends are you noticing when it comes to the, you know, the types of inroads that wind and solar are making here in Saskatchewan? And, and are there any differences that you would note between, you know, Saskatchewan and other jurisdictions? Well, yeah, I think uh, on one hand, the, the developers appreciate the long-term view that has been taken by SAS Power uh, that's been shared, uh, first shared with the industry back in 2022, showing a 13-year uh, development plan and build-out and their commitment to three gigawatts of new renewables out to 2035. Showing that gives confidence to the industry and allows for a more patient view towards investment in assessing and developing the wind and soil resources that we have here in the province. Developers know that if they're not successful um, in one procurement, there's going to be other procurements down the road that they can bid on. I think in terms of trends, I would say that we're seeing more similarities versus differences uh, compared to other jurisdictions. So what we're seeing here in Saskatchewan, and, and I'll say elsewhere, is the project sizes are starting to standardize around 200 megawatt tranches or more for wind in terms of project size and 100 megawatts or more for solar, uh, along with larger procurements of the 600 megawatts or more. And that's really helping to attract world-class organizations into competing and bidding on these projects and procurements. What we're seeing here and elsewhere is that these project sizes are also utilizing state of the art, you know, five, six and up to seven megawatt onshore wind turbine technologies. So that's really driving the efficiency uh, that's delivering uh, cost benefit and the economies of scale back to uh, back to the utility and others. Um, I think the similarity that we're seeing is that there's a blend of utility-led procurements as well as utility-supported uh, industrial procurements or corporate power purchase agreements uh, that are being offered out, uh, such as SAS Power's Renewable Access Service. So again, corporate power purchase agreements are something that are being developed out in a number of different jurisdictions and provinces across Canada. The most compelling benefit for new solar and wind is that they're really delivering low cost, proven and predictable, timely, clean energy to the grid. And they're supporting the emissions reductions uh, goals of the utility and of industry. Okay, thanks Erwin. Um, Courtney, we've got a slide up here, lots of sort of details of this, and I'm sure this is uh, probably simplified compared to the kind of documents that you would have uh, on your desk, but can you just walk us through what a typical procurement process might look like, again, from SAS Power's perspective? Sure. So SAS Power uses a two-stage procurement, procurement process for IPP projects. And we start that process with a request for supplier qualifications. And that typically takes around one to two months. It's open for about one to two months. IPPs are qualified through this process on a financial capacity and experience basis. Um, and the intent here is really to ensure that 
the developers that make it onto the next stage have the financial resources and the experience to develop the projects that we need them to develop. So the IPPs that are qualified are then invited to uh, participate in the request for proposal stage, which typically takes around four to five months. It's open for about four to five months. Um, prior to the RFSQ going out and prior to starting any proc procurement process, uh, we often post an advance notice for IPPs to inform them of the upcoming procurement. And you just heard Erwin speak about the importance of communication with IPPs and letting them know, giving them, you know, a significant lead time, as much lead time as you can. And so the, the advance notice is really to inform IPPs of uh, upcoming procurement and signal to the market to get ready to start preparing sites and um, get your requirements together in order to participate in the procurement. So at this point, IPPs will begin contacting landowners and RMs to discuss potential project sites that uh, might fit within the upcoming pr procurement. So SAS Power will then evaluate proposals submitted by the IPPs once the RFP uh, is closed. And that will be based on a whole series of predefined evaluation criteria that we share with the IPP as part of the RFP document. So these criteria are typically price, uh, indigenous ownership and participation. There's a technical aspect in terms of the actual resource that the facility will have. There's a stakeholder engagement and community aspect. And then of course, an environmental screening. So SAS Power and the preferred proponent, once the preferred proponent is selected, we would enter into a closing process with the preferred proponent where we uh, complete due diligence. So it's just extra kind of uh, checks and balances on the project that we've selected. And we gather all the documentation that we need to feel comfortable with the project uh, from the IPP. We get that information prior to signing the power purchase agreement. And so at this point in the process, uh, SAS Power expects um, just kind of tying back to the community. Um, ex at this point in the process, SAS Power really does expect that the IPP has had all of the conversations with the community, engaged um, in the community um, engagement uh, process, and really understands the expectations of the community and has really considered those expectations when um, submitting its proposal. After a, um, a PPA is signed, then we have a project secured from a contractual standpoint. And we then inform all of the unsuccessful IPPs and we offer you know, debrief meetings and we provide them with feedback so that they can really learn from this proposal submission and continue to develop their bids and, and come back next competition and bid um, a little more strategically or competitively. Uh, so we publicly announce the successful IPP to the public and we um, inform the RM of the project status. And that's really when the work begins on the project. So the IPP then begins developing the project, um, or I should say continues developing the project. Uh, they need to get all of their uh, required permits. They need to complete the engineering and the uh, facility design. They also work together with SAS Power to complete, um, SAS Power completes the interconnection studies for the facility based on um, the technical information that the IPP provides. And this is important because SAS Power needs to design and construct facilities that are required to connect the project to our grid. Uh, dates get set based on um, when we can interconnect the project and when the project is able to be um, constructed. So this, this process can take between 18 and 24 months. And then I, the IPP and SAS Power start constructing and commissioning their facilities, which can take another 18 to 24 months. So IPPs often plan their construction uh, facility, their construction activities over more than one construction season as they often need um, certain weather conditions to safely construct, um, particularly for wind projects. 
Uh, once the IPPs and SAS powers facilities are constructed and commissioned, then the facility uh, reaches commercial op operation and can start providing SAS power uh, power to its grid. Okay. Um, let's get a slide up here just about the community engagement piece. So how does SAS power work to ensure that IPPs, you know, are considering the needs of communities, you know, who are impacted by, you know, these projects? Yeah, for sure. So as part of the more detailed community engagement piece in the competitive solicitation, we ask each IPP as part of their proposal submission to really detail for us their what their community engagement plan is and how they're committing to work with the community that they're wanting to develop the project in. So the IPP has to show SAS Power that there's been information sharing and communication between the IPP and the community and that there is a, there is a relationship there. Uh, we score each proposal as part of our evaluation on the project engagement plan. So that will include, you know, engagement, their engagement purpose and goals, their stakeholder identification approach, project impacts, uh, project activity plan, and even things uh, as detailed as their issues and grievance management plan. So SAS Power really doesn't want to be developing projects even through IPPs in communities that aren't supportive of uh, renewable generation facility development. We um, do place a lot of importance on community support and engagement for these these projects. Okay, thanks. Um, so time to the community side, I wanna invite Jennifer Chamberlain. And so Jennifer will pop on, but I'll, Jennifer, I'll give you a, a proper introduction here. So Jennifer has a, over a decade and a half of professional planning and community consultation experience in Saskatchewan. Uh, Jennifer has worked in both private and non uh, pardon me, nonprofit sectors at the municipal and provincial levels. Throughout her career, she's had the opportunity to work with a number of municipalities and industries supporting investment, growth, and municipal capacity throughout Saskatchewan. So in her current position as the manager of community planning with SARM, she works with municipalities on issues related to land use, planning, and development. Jennifer is a full member of the Canadian Institute of Planners and a registered professional planner in Saskatchewan. So, um, so welcome. And um, so I guess my first question for you, Jennifer. So Again, this community engagement, you know, that, that's creating a space for, uh, for conversations and, uh, and dialogue. What should RMs expect from large scale wind and solar developers regarding, you know, community consultation and, and, and how can they ensure there's a, there's a clear and shared understanding before starting? Thanks, Derek. So in addition to SAS Power's community engagement requirements that Courtney uh, touched on earlier, Large scale wind and solar developers will need to undertake community engagement as part of the Ministry of Environment's environmental assessment process. So typically we've seen this engagement involve public open houses where the developer uh, will present information on the project and also be available to answer questions from the community. So in addition to this engagement, municipalities can outline their own public consultation requirements for large scale wind and solar projects within their zoning bylaw. So I do encourage developers to notify that the municipality of the potential for a project in their area as soon as possible. Ideally, they will engage with the municipality at the same time or just before they are approaching landowners to obtain land option agreements. Early engagement with the municipality and the community can help to avoid potential issues and time delays later in that development process uh, as well as to help reduce project risks. So it provides an opportunity to respond to questions and concerns and for local knowledge and considerations to be incorporated into the project proposal early on. It can also help to ensure there is a mutual understanding of current local requirements and processes that are in place. So such as zoning regulations, uh, which can vary from one municipality to the next. Okay, thanks Jennifer. Qu question for you, Erwin. In, in SAS Power's work on the future planning side, you know, we hear some of the same questions and concerns, you know, as, uh, um, as SAS Power explores, you know, these larger wind and uh, solar projects. But um, um, for example, one question, how do areas get selected for wind and solar projects? I think it's, you know, more from that developer perspective. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, the developers certainly uh, have a number of considerations. I will say that Saskatchewan has a world-class wind resource and we've got 
best in Canada solar. Uh, I think the wind resource, anyone who's been outside lately can attest to that as well. Um, so developers will initially place meteorological equipment to assess uh, the quality of the wind resource. Um, and suitable land for wind is away from bird nesting or bat roosting areas and any bird or bat migratory flight path areas. Uh, the ideal land for solar is slightly inclined and south facing. And uh, there's actually economic drivers from a, a landowner compensation perspective uh, to locate the solar facilities on marginal agricultural or grazing farmland. Um, in terms of proximity to existing power infrastructure and transmission lines, developers want to locate near to uh, this infrastructure as possible uh, in terms of current or future transmission or intertie capacity that ultimately supports integrating renewable and storage facilities into the grid. Other infrastructure considerations like roadways or all-weather grid roads are important in providing construction and operations and maintenance access to the renewable energy facilities. Uh, we look for feedback from rights holders, and municipal authorities, landowners, and other stakeholders uh, as we, as the developers work through the various permitting and approval requirements of the RM, Ministry of Environment, Farmland Security Board, and others. Um, I want to point out that the Surface Rights Act does not apply in the development of the wind and solar resources, and locating these assets is completely voluntary and requires landowner consent uh, from all parties that are impacted. Um, ideally, the site, again, is in close proximity to any First Nations uh, communities that have partnered in the project. Okay, thanks for that. Um... I often hear questions about the environmental uh, aspects of this. So we've asked uh, Jennifer Sargent uh, from SAS Power to, uh, to join us to maybe speak to, uh, speak to some of this. So, um, so Jennifer has worked in the Environment and Sustainability Department at SAS Power since 2008. Um, she is currently the Manager of Environmental Assessment and Approvals, and her team plays a vital role leading the environmental assessment and regulatory permitting activities for SAS Power projects. So Jennifer holds a master's degree in environmental studies from Dalhousie University and a bachelor of science degree in biology from the University Hi. of Victoria. So, so Jennifer, the first, first question for you. Um, one, an, again, another question that we get asked, you know, how much land um, do these projects use? How does that compare to other generation options that SAS Power has at its disposal? Yeah, uh, thanks, Derek. Um, a 200 megawatt wind facility, such as the one we have uh, down near Assiniboia called Golden South, um, typically has about 50 wind turbines installed, um, and usually it's one wind turbine per quarter section. Uh, the wind turbines are typically spaced across the landscape, with each taking up approximately one to two acres of actual footprint per turbine. Um, for reference, a CFL football field, including its end zones, is approximately two acres. So um, having the actual footprint of the wind turbine leaves opportunity to continue to use the land in between for purposes like farming. Uh, so in total, the entire wind facility may span up to 50,000 acres, uh, but this depends largely on the technology that's used. Um, but the actual footprint of the wind turbines and associated infrastructure, such as collector lines and access roads, could take between roughly 100 to 200 acres. A um, 100 megawatt solar facility, on the other hand, typically requires approximately three to seven acres of land to generate one megawatt of power for a total requirement of anywhere between 640 to 940 acres, which is equivalent to approximately four to six quarter sections of land. Again, it all depends on the design of the solar facility and the layout of the solar array. Uh, hydro facilities um, are, require a significantly larger footprint given the amount of flooded area required for a reservoir and depends on the size of the facility, geology, and the topography of the area. As an example, SAS Power's existing Nipawin Hydro Dam has an estimated footprint of 37 acres per megawatt of power produced. Other generations 
uh, types such as natural gas, uh, small modular reactor, nuclear, and biomass require roughly 160 acres, which is equivalent to a quarter section of land for the generation uh, facility site. What kind of things have you heard again from, you know, in terms of uh, siting, like are there, you know, are there concerns around using agricultural land for, for these kinds of, um, you know, for these kind of things as well, or, you know, um, you know, Where's the best place to put these things again? Are you, you know, you, are you sort of getting into sort of native landscapes versus agricultural land? You know, what kind of things have you heard on that or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's the challenge trying to comp trying to balance the competing interests because we've heard lots of concerns from landowners and the public in general related to siting new generation, in particular renewable generation on agriculturally productive land. But on the other hand, we're also hearing concerns from environmental organizations regarding siting on native landscapes, given their estimates that only 10 to 20 percent of native landscapes remain in the province. So SAS Power and the IPPs uh, and developers across North America are challenged to try and balance the competing interests and concerns related to land use uh, for all generation options, not just renewables. Okay. Um, I've heard questions about the recyclability, you know, and, and end of life of, um, you know, some of these generating um, sort of facilities. So can you maybe talk to just that whole matter of, of recyclability at the end of life for, for wind and solar? Yeah, for sure. Uh, every generation option uh, has environmental trade-offs that need to be considered. And this includes thinking through decommissioning at the end of its operating life and how the environment will be reclaimed. Every power option will generate some form of waste that needs to be dealt with. And at the time of decommissioning, such as removal of on-site facilities and infrastructure, and where possible, recycling materials like scrap metal and concrete. For wind turbines, it's estimated that anywhere between 85 to 90% of the turbine materials, such as steel, copper wire, electronics, and gearing can be recycled or reused. Uh, wind turbines are made of materials that are increasing in salvage value. Um, however, the blades have proven harder to recycle and have generally gone to landfill, although efforts are being made to find ways to reuse the blades. And in North America, wind turbine blade recycling programs are coming into play and are expected to continue to grow. Um, this includes reclaiming carbon fiber for use in composite products used by other industries or for manufacturing of new um, turbine blades. There's also recycling of solar panels, and that's currently an emerging industry in Canada. Uh, and some provinces, such as in Alberta, have even initiated pilots to help reclaim expired solar panels. Uh, we expect this industry will be fully developed by the time the first utility scale solar facility will be decommissioned in Saskatchewan. And I don't know, maybe Irwin has something to add to that, uh, given his experience with the developers. Erwin, any additional comments on that that you'd want to make in terms of where this is going? Obviously, you know, these things have been around for a while, but I think there's, you know, there's going to be a lot, of, lot, to, lot to do in the future, but we're not there yet, of course, because they haven't all been around uh, for, for, their, for their full uh, length of life yet. So, Yeah, I'll just echo what Jennifer said, that the, um, the capacity of recycling facilities is growing. Uh, I'll say that our operations... Uh, director is working with industry uh, to look at how uh, blades can be reused. Um, we know it's a challenge, but again, we're seeing some very uh, innovative approaches and the ability to use that carbon fiber um, as an additive to concrete, again, is, is another opportunity. But uh, ultimately, we want to see these facilities recycled. Um, as much as possible, uh, and, and those are the efforts of the industry. Okay. Jennifer, I'm just gonna share um, another slide here, just in terms of some of the, the, the greenhouse gas um, emissions over the, over the life of some of these projects. Can you just sort of kind of explain what we're seeing on the graph here? Yeah, you bet. Uh, the graph on the screen provides estimates of life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and this was developed by the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. Uh, 
Uh, on the high end, we have coal without carbon capture and sequestration, and on the lower end are the renewables and nuclear. So current re regulations require a for focus on reporting greenhouse gas emissions uh, directly from SAS power facilities, uh, but we're also looking at the life cycle emission amounts, which include emissions generated through construction operations and decommissioning. So that's sort of the what you're seeing on the screen there. Okay. Next, can you just sort of walk us through some of the, you know, some of the the, the process um, in terms of environmental regulations that um, um, that you know would, would play out through the through the through the course of a project like this. Yeah, for sure. It's unfortunate that Brady Pollock wasn't able to be here. He is um, from the Ministry of Environment, and he can certainly speak to that process better. But I mean, SAS Power as a proponent, we are very familiar with the process. Um, and we know that as part of the regulatory review process, any new utility scale renewable project, such as wind or solar, must undergo review under the Environmental Assessment Act. And this is led by the Ministry of Environment. On the screen, you're looking at the environmental assessment process and it starts with the um, proponent developing the proposal and applying um, to the Ministry of Environment. And at stage three is the screening where the Ministry of Environment will undergo a technical review uh, to understand how the project will interact with the environment, whether positively or negatively, and what measures need to be put in place to manage or reduce those environmental effects. The assessment um, that the proponent needs to undertake needs to consider both biological and human effects during all phases of the project, from planning through to construction and operation, but also decommissioning at the end of the facility's life. Take, for example, a solar facility. Uh, the environmental assessment will examine such things as how siting may impact wildlife and their habitats, how vegetation will be managed during construction and operations to limit the spread of weeds, how stormwater will be managed during operation to limit offsite impacts to neighboring land, and how the project will be decommissioned at the end of the life. The challenge for any developer is to understand, in, in some cases predict with the newer technologies, the potential environmental risks and effects of each of the generation options as we move forward with the clean energy transition. Depending on the project put forward, proponents may only be required to go as far as the screening step number three. Others may be required to undergo a full environmental impact ass assessment, which would take you all the way to number eight. Um, and through the environmental assessment process, the Ministry of Environment's environmental assessment and stewardship branch works with the proponent to ensure that all pertinent environmental, uh, which includes ecological, socioeconomic, and cultural issues are addressed adequately and appropriately. And if all the relevant environmental issues cannot be sufficiently mitigated by approval conditions, the approval will be denied by the Minister of the Environment. If the Minister of Environment approves a project, this does not mean the project can proceed directly to construction. Rather, it means that the project can proceed to get other permits and approvals that may be required by other provincial, municipal, and federal regulations. Uh, I would encourage anyone, if they're interested, to learn more about Saskatchewan's environmental assessment. Um, please visit the website that's listed on the screen there. Uh, what's really interesting is they provide a list of all projects that are currently under review under the Environmental Assessment Act, but they also provide a history of all projects that have completed review. And so you can um, access documents like their environmental impact assessments, the minister's reasons for decision. There's lots of information that is helpful for the public um, to check out. Okay, thanks for all that. Lots of lots of moving pieces for that. So, um, another question for you, Jennifer, just on the environmental side. So, another question I often hear, you know, often you know, wind and solar are paired with batteries, and factoring all that kind of all that kind of thing in, like, is this better for the environment? Once you factor in, you know, obviously the energy intensity of manufacturing, you got the you know end of life recyclability considerations. What's your take on that question? Uh 
Yeah, utility scale battery energy storage, it's a fairly new technology for Saskatchewan, and we're only beginning to understand it in terms of technology capabilities, limitations, and environmental effects. As we grow our wind and solar fleet, power uh, battery energy storage will play an increasingly important role in order to stabilize the system with these intermittent generation sources, um, and it will help to support our goal to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, as we plan our future generation mix, being well informed going into that process allows us to minimize the risks. Uh, we do know that a large amount of raw materials, including metals and non-metals, are used to manufacture batteries. And how these materials are mined and the environmental and human costs have to be considered as part of the process. This is a discussion we're seeing around electrification in general and a growth in the use of lithium batteries from electric vehicles. Um, however, there are impacts from battery energy storage that we're just starting to understand. Uh, an example would be if there's a fire, air emissions, including toxic gases, are released due to the burning batteries. Uh, these are some of the many considerations we need to study and weigh from an environmental perspective to help inform SASPAR's decisions as we move forward. And this perspective needs to be put alongside the non-environmental criteria too, uh, such as reliability, human and social factors, as well as cost. Just going to pop a poll up here now, just on the uh, the life cycle of a turbine blade. So, so question for you: What is the average lifespan of a new wind turbine? So your options: less than twenty years, twenty years, twenty five years, or um, thirty years or more. So I'll give you a moment to respond to that. And I know the the life of uh, wind turbines is is a is a common um, is a common question. Okay, I'll leave that for one more moment before I close that off. Okay, the most common results, I'll share these back with you, um, is uh, 25 years, turns out 30 years or more um, is, uh, is, the, is the answer to uh, that question and apparently potentially longer uh, when, when, uh, when properly uh, maintained, so. Um, I want to invite Erwin back just to talk to us um, just about the responsibilities around uh, end of life at a wind or solar facility. So Erwin, whose responsibility is this to clean, uh, you know, to do the cleanup after, after the life of a solar facility or a wind facility? Uh, it's the responsibility of the independent power producer uh, and the developer for decommissioning the facility and remediating the site uh, when, it's, when it's time. Uh, as such, they need to follow all the local, provincial, and federal laws and agreements that they have with the landowners around that obligation. Uh, developers will work with the landowners to arrange for end-of-life securities to cover off the cost of decommissioning and reclamation. Because the resource is still there, it's not being depleted, um, and at the end of commercial life, that resource is very well understood in terms of its availability. One of the industry trends we're seeing, especially with uh, the later generation of wind turbines, is the ability to repower or retop uh, these turbines at the end of life uh, and to continue on with their operation. Um, some of those same opportunities exist with solar and because panels are getting more and more efficient, as panels are replaced and recycled, um, the uh, efficiency and, and the amount of uh, uh, generation capability can, can actually go up over time. Okay. Um, I guess a question for you, Courtney, kind of on a related matter. So what is SAS Power's view on decommissioning and land reclamation when these projects are, you know, solar, wind, these large scale projects are reaching their end of, of their useful life? Yeah, so land reclamation and decommissioning are are really important to SAS Power, and uh, you know each project is 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 different in kind of um, uh, the the landowner agreements and what and what is determined between the landowner and the IPP. Uh, but what we can say from SAS Power's perspective is that um, in each power purchase agreement that we sign with the IPP, there is a 
there is a provision in the power purchase agreement for the IPP to decommission and reclaim the land at the end of the project. Okay, that's part of the agreement. Okay. Um, question for Jennifer Chamberlain. This relates to some of the, you know, some of the process things. So, you know, permits, land use plans, bylaws. You know, these are some of the things that, of course, RMs deal with. For in, uh, for RMs who are interested, or you know, in this, or being or are being approached, you know, for the first time by IPPs, what are some considerations that they should be thinking about? And you know, if they if they if they're looking for help or some advice or support, you know, where could they look um, for for uh, for some advice just to make sure they're doing this kind of the best way possible? Mm -hmm. So prior to even being approached by an IPP, I do encourage RMs to give consideration to how they want to regulate wind and solar development within their community through their zoning bylaw. So local considerations may vary from one municipality to the next. Uh, so it is important for each community to consider their local context. They can give consideration to such things as whether they support these types of projects throughout their community or only within certain areas. If allowing within their municipality, they can consider whether it will be a permitted use or a discretionary use and within what districts of the zoning bylaw. They can also consider what criteria they will use to assess the proposed development and what information they would like to receive from the developer, such as emergency response plans or post-construction reclamation plans and end of life decommissioning plans. So the regulations they will include in their zoning bylaw should also be considered. These can include such things as setbacks, size and scale, signage and lighting, and landscaping standards and maintenance plans. For support with developing zoning bylaw regulations, municipalities can reach out to professional community planners. Contact information is available online for planning consultants through the Saskatchewan Professional Planners Institute. The community planning branch at the province may also be a resource as well as myself. So I can support municipalities in drafting their zoning bylaw regulations as well as connecting them to other municipalities that uh, may have experienced existing projects uh, as they would be able to provide some lessons learned as well. Okay, thank you. Erwin, from your perspective, what resources are out there that could help, you know, potential host communities and, you know, intending IPPs before the two meet for the first time? And, and is there anything that CANRIA can, you know, is doing in terms of engaging, you know, with, with either of these parties? Um, I'll say that the community engagement dialogue is being led by the independent power producers and the developers that are participating in, in the utility procurements. And they're working with the landowners, the communities and local First Nations partners typically through open houses and direct meetings with the RM councils as they assess the project developments with the intention of uh, bidding on these procurements. The independent power producers will work with and notify all landowners directly impacted by the potential projects as well as those living within a certain radius of the development that varies uh, in terms of, of wind and solar. One of uh, the developers that's a member of Canria Potentia has some really good information and uh, frequently asked question FAQ on their 200 megawatt Golden South project near Singapore. So I would encourage people to look at the website um, and see what they've done. Uh, they created a community liaison committee uh, that included members of the community um, as well as potential wind and and the construction company to have a set of uh, conversations during the construction and uh, during the operation of the facility. Um, if anyone has questions, they're welcome to reach out to me uh, at Canria, and I'm I'm happy to continue the, uh, the discussion on uh, what to expect when uh, when considering wind and solar development. Okay, thanks. Um, back to you, Jennifer Chamberlain. So if, if an IPP is successful in a competition, you know, what questions should the RM ask, you know, prior to the IPP uh, starting development and maybe just a follow on to that. Um, RMs often have spring road bans, you know, in place to reduce, you know, impacts to the roads. What kind of conversations should a potential host RM be having with IPPs regarding things like roads and other local infrastructure? Mm -hmm. 
So before moving forward with development, the IPP will need to submit a formal development application to the municipality. So the zoning bylaw can be referenced to determine what information is required to properly assess the application. The issuance of a development permit by the municipality then can outline the conditions for development to move forward. So the projects may also result in the requirement for new road construction agreements, road crossing agreements, road maintenance and dust control agreements during that construction phase, uh, as well as licensing for gravel extraction. So it's important the municipality and the IPP are on the same page for the construction phase of the project, as this phase really can be quite impactful to the community in comparison to that operational phase. So discussions for such aspects as preferred routes for construction traffic, road maintenance agreements, and consideration for the timing of road bans can be beneficial. There can be a number of subcontractors as well for these projects during the construction phase. So having those open lines of communication with all parties and determining who, muni who municipal agreements will be with uh, can be important as well to consider. Okay, thanks. Um... We'll take a couple minutes for questions. We, we'll definitely have more questions than we have uh, time, but um, I guess, Courtney, I have, a, I have a question for you in terms of, uh, it sounds like, what's the future, is, any indications in terms of what the future planned size of some of the projects are? I mean, you said at the outset, SAS Power is planning 3,000 3, megawatts. You know, what, what kind of sizes are we looking at right now? Do you see that changing um, in the future? Could, could they get larger? Could they get smaller? How do you see that going? Yeah, so that's a good question. Right now, we're seeing um, we're we're developing a hundred megawatt size solar facilities, and we just kind of started venturing into that space. Our okay. first two solar facilities were ten megawatts, um, and now we're in the hundred megawatt space for solar. For wind, we're right around two hundred megawatts per um, facility, and we are planning to kind of stay within that um, size frame for the for the near term. But we're continuing to watch and see, you know, what turbine technology does, um, where industry is going, what industries, you know, communicating to us about developments in other markets. We continue to engage with Canria on this topic and um, we'll see uh, if things change into the future. Okay. I guess, well, I have you another, another maybe related question. So in terms of the IPP model, is SAS Power satisfied with this? You know, obviously, has this been the approach for kind of recent history in terms of how these projects are getting built? Do you, do you plan to do you plan to kind of keep going that way? Because I think some people wonder, it's like, you know, why, why doesn't SAS Power build some of these projects, you know, itself rather than relying IPP on IPPs exclusively um, for these kind of projects? Right. Yeah. So um, outside of our first two quite small wind facilities that SAS Power built um, themselves, ourselves. Okay. We have been using an IPP model and we have continued to use an IPP model because we see significant benefit. And it's really, um, the we see significant benefit in the cost, but also in the operation and in the, in the energy that we're getting from these facilities. Um, so there's nothing signaling to us that, you know, this model isn't working. Um, we're continually impressed by IPP build. So we are, we are looking to move forward with IPP builds into the future. Okay. Um, another question, and Erwin, you may have something to say on this. Just a question of, are these kind of projects a better fit in the Southern part of the province versus the North? I, I don't, I know there are, um, you know, not all the wind corridors necessarily are, um, you know, in exclusively in the southern part of the province, but in any kind of comments on, you know, again, where these things tend to get placed or, or where there's opportunities? Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, obviously, again, boosting capacity is, is really important. So having the transmission infrastructure uh, to connect these projects into having the intertie capacity and, and, um, I think when you look at the load on the system as well, a lot of that uh, consideration is is in the southern part of the province. Um, again, I'll say that the wind resource is kind of that Great Plains wind resource that's being developed here. It's being developed uh, in North Dakota and, and continues on southward down into the U.S. So that is that is really the resource that uh, that we're looking uh, that's looking to be developed here. Okay. Um, 
Any comments about storage? Are, are all the projects right now planned to be, you know, kind of exclusively, you know, just on the generation side, you know, just the wind and solar, or do you expect to see solar, or pardon me, storage being incorporated into some of these uh, as well? And again, we don't want to ask any questions that are secret in terms of the agreement. Mm -hmm. So, but so I'll let I'll maybe pose that to both of you and, and to get your thoughts. Sure, I can I can start. Uh, right now, we we don't have any IPP uh, storage facilities, including renewables paired with storage. It's uh, it's a conversation that we're um, having with IPPs quite frequently because there there is interest there and it's happening in other markets. Uh, right now, SAS Power is um, developing batteries. Uh, as SAS power, so we're not using the IPP model for uh, battery development, but it is a conversation and a potential potential focus uh, for the future. Okay, Erwin, I know that storage is part of the scope of of the Canria um, kind of area of interest. And what what are your thoughts on um, where do you expect to see storage in the future? I'll just echo what what Courtney said that it's uh, that it's a conversation that's being held uh, in a number of uh, different jurisdictions. Um, we are seeing storage being developed out in Alberta in a meaningful way, in Ontario in a meeting, meaningful way. Uh, certainly there's a different regulatory market there and other different structures like time of use and things that are, uh, I'll say, supporting the economics of those the storage developments elsewhere, but um, it's a very interesting conversation, and there's a lot of different uh, models across Canada for how storage is being uh, integrated into the grid um, through IPP models and through and through the Crown Utility models there as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, we're a little past time. And uh, again, I know there's, there's lots of questions. Hopefully most of them we were able to speak to just through the, the regular course of the of the content. I just wanna kind of go back to, to some of you at, in terms of just kind of, um, maybe Erwin, I'll start with you. What would you hope to see in terms of these types of projects, you know, five or 10 years from now, how do you see this conversation evolving? Thanks, Derek. I I'll just say that the trends that we're seeing as other provinces and jurisdictions are moving towards more renewable energy and storage uh, includes the pairing of uh, utility scale renewables and battery storage to support system operational flexibility. Um, we're seeing the opportunity for direct purchase of clean power by industrials, by municipalities and other energy consumers through products like uh, power purchase agreements. Uh, I think the other thing that we're seeing here is a balancing out of renewable and storage integration uh, into both the transmission and distribution systems between the different utility, industrial community, commercial and residential scales. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting to see how that develops out in other jurisdictions and how we're, we're managing that here uh, in the province as well. Okay, thanks, Erwin. Uh, Jennifer Chamberlain, I'll maybe ask that same question to you. What do you expect to see or hope to see, you know, in this space, you know, over the next five, 10 years? Large scale wind and solar projects are still fairly new here in Saskatchewan. Uh, there can be a bit of a learning curve with any new form of development uh, for all involved, not just the municipalities, but collectively working together. So my hope is that we continue to learn from existing projects and apply these lessons learned to continue to improve the processes and projects uh, as we move forward with them. Okay, thanks. And Courtney, I guess I'll give you the last word on this from a SAS Power perspective. What do you think? Yeah, at SAS Power, we're, we're really excited about the IPP space and we're watching it closely. We're gonna continue to collaborate with groups like Canria, um, other RMs and communities. And this is definitely uh, an exciting and increasing space for SAS Power. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'll leave it there. Other than uh, we would like to uh, just get your thoughts in terms of um, just some evaluation. There's three questions there. We wanna, there's three things. Did you learn something new today? Um, just an overall rating of the event and uh, maybe the last or mo maybe most important one, would you come back to another one? Um, 
for those that have attended some of the uh, more recent ones, um, I think the plan is to have them all posted up uh, at, at the same time. Um, so I don't have an exact time frame on that, but uh, again, some of the more recent ones here, all, all of this past series is going to be posted up uh, at the same time. So again, on behalf of uh, myself, everyone at SAS Power, and uh, Erwin and Jennifer uh, Chamberlain from uh, SARM, really appreciate uh, your time and attention today. Again, and if you're interested in some of the topics, and again, often the Power Talks focus on a specific area, definitely go and look at some of the other Power Talks because some of the questions I know, um, we do get into those in, um, in more detail in some other Power Talks. So we definitely encourage you um, to go and check those out. So um, with that, Again, a heartfelt thanks uh, again for your time and, uh, and attention today. And uh, again, if you're curious to follow uh, along more on other kind of opportunities to participate, other power talks, other things like this, visit saspower.com slash engage, sign up for the newsletter and you'll be up to date. Thanks so much, everyone. I hope you have a good rest of your day.